So I'll just cover a couple of things. So welcome back, and I hope you enjoyed our break. And if you please remember, if you turned your mobile phone on, to please switch to silent mode. And while you're doing that, no smoking. And no smoking otherwise as well. Uh, our, format, our forum this afternoon, uh, as you know, has been primarily in English. It will continue to be in English. If you'd like translation, I don't think I've seen anybody. Is there anybody who's using the headsets? Would you raise your hand if you're using a headset? Okay, there's not much Mandarin translation. Maybe we'll, next year we'll get lots of people who don't understand English so we can have more Mandarin translation requirement. Yeah, we'll get more mainland people. Okay. I'm very pleased to um, introduce Bart Deckram. We just met recently in San Francisco, and uh, you know, true to the name, actually, he does remind me of Bart Simpson in many ways. I'm sure you've heard that before. Um, I think uh, he's a, the most um, energized, sort of rabble-rousing speaker that we have had at Delft ever. <laughs> and I'm really looking forward to his uh, presentation. So Bart, had, um, just uh, until recently, was uh, the form. Uh, well, he's now former, but he was vice president of Disney Interactive. And he was the founder of Tapulus, one of the first companies that was doing iPhone games, makers of Tap Tap Revenge. And uh, that was one of the most popular music games of his time. You'll hear a little bit uh, about that. Uh, he's been developing apps in, uh, for the App Store, and uh, his company was acquired by Disney. There's been a lot of talk about Disney. They've acquired a lot. For those of you who don't know, aside from uh, acquiring Pixar that you heard, uh, they most recently acquired Lucas, uh, Lucasfilm. So they now own the two major digital entertainment uh, uh, and content creation companies in San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and given that they were a Los Angeles or Hollywood, uh, you know, studio-based uh, company, they, uh, it's been uh, a, probably a very interesting integration of organizational cultures. Uh, so Bart left there so he can go on to do what he's going to do next, and he'll talk a little bit about that, I'm sure. Um, it says here, and I want to read this, that Bart was uh, named one of Fast Company's most creative people in business. He was also advertising Age's 2010 Creativity Top 50 and Newsweek Silicon Valley Future Superstars. And so, and yes, and he's still looking for that future. We were talking about it this morning, Bart. You missed that session. <laughs> okay. So, um, Bart, please come to the stage. With all due respect, thank you very much for being here. Hi guys, how are you? Let me find the thing. I'm looking for the thingy. Here we go. And boom. Okay. And let's see if this mic is working. I'll try this too. Hello? Oh, that works. Cool. Hi, how are you guys doing? Nice lunch, take a break, take a nap. This is the perfect opportunity for that. Um, it is great to be here. Uh, Hal, thank you so much for, for inviting me. It's, it's great to be back uh, in Hong Kong. I um, spent some time nearby in Korea, uh, maybe 10 years ago. And at that time, I would come to Hong Kong for business and sometimes just for fun. So I've been here like five times, but it's, it's, our, it's already been maybe 10 years. Um, so I'm originally from Belgium, and so that's where the little accent and the, the weird comes from. Uh, but then I came to America um, maybe a long, a long time ago. Um, and I, have I, I went to school in California, and I have started three or four companies. I'm a serial entrepreneur, is what we call it in Silicon Valley. Uh, and so I, I worked on a company. Uh, the guy on the left there is Andy Hertzfeld, who um, kind of a legend in Silicon Valley for, for writing uh, the Macintosh operating system and one of Steve Jobs' uh, close friends. Um, as I mentioned, I lived in Korea for a year and a half. 
uh, and, and that was an amazing experience, being exposed to um, people that were really using their phone uh, as the main com computing device. Uh, that was in 2005. Uh, I helped launch Firefox, uh, and I did the, the, the most, I, I helped come up with that logo, uh, and because um, I was in charge of marketing, but then I also did a deal with Google where we point search to Google, and then that became the business model for, for Mozilla. Even for the iPhone, it's a big revenue source, and, and uh, Maxton and other companies that build web browsers. So I worked on Firefox um, and, and a couple of other things. And, 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 and when the iPhone was announced in, uh, I guess that was January 2007, I got really excited because I had been living as I mentioned in, in Korea, and, and I'd been looking for a phone. I noticed people were using their phone for everything, and all the phones kind of sucked. Uh, I had, had a BlackBerry and a Samsung and an LG and a Palm Pilot and a, um, all of these things, and none of them were good enough. And then that one came out, and I go, woo, this is going to be big. And I got really excited, and, and I started telling everybody, one day there will be 100 million of these things out there. This is maybe November 2007, right after the iPhone came out. And um, I, I want to build a business here. I think in 18 months, we can have a million users. That was sort of a crazy thing to say at the time. And, and that's what people told me. Uh, that's the feedback we got from people in, in November, December 2007 was, you're crazy. Um, you're just another crazy entrepreneur. You should focus on the mobile web, uh, also known as WAP, if anybody. If you know what that means, then you're old. Um, or, or go do SMS services. Uh, there's nobody's using this iPhone. I was like, yeah, but that's the thing I'm interested in. So I decided to ignore uh, people's advice and started a company that was one of the first companies uh, in the iPhone space, and it was called Tapulous. And the original idea was that we were going to build uh, a mobile network, a mobile social network, kind of like Facebook on mobile. And so we built an app that let you exchange business cards with friends, and we built an app where you could share, take a picture and then share it with people near you. Uh, we built an app that let you chat with people. So we built all these apps, and, and, and all of them sort of look familiar to things that became very popular and successful afterwards. The address book, the company called Bump just sold to Google. Instagram was obviously the, the leader in, in, in photos, and, and, and we were doing a lot of, lot of flirting on, on Twinkle. And, and of course, Tinder is an app that's super popular in, in many parts of the world now. And so we had all these things uh, that look a lot like what, what happened today. And so it was kind of tempting to say, and every now and then I've, I've caught myself saying, we were doing in 2008 what Facebook is doing today, if you look at you know, what the, how they acquired Instagram and, and WhatsApp. But one of the things I want to talk about today is lessons that I've learned about the App Store and how to be successful. And, and this is just a stupid way of thinking. Um, because the reality is, um, you know, lots of people, you, you, I get phone calls every day from people saying, I have a great idea for an app. I just need somebody to build it. And I go, whoa, <laughs> the just part, that's the hard part. Ideas are cheap, you know, and it's easy to come up with an idea. And it's easy for me to say, well, I had the idea for photo sharing in 2008, but it turns out the timing was wrong. At that time, that was not the right time. 2013 is the right time for that, 14. And that's a lot of, five years is a long time, and your business can really, you know, go in a very different direction. And then the other thing that was different is that Instagram is really good, and, 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 and WhatsApp, and these apps, and Tinder. And our apps, those apps that we did, they were okay, but they were not amazing. And so, so when people say we had a great idea and it's just like something somebody else did, well, but your execution, your timing was off, so it's kind of a silly argument. And it's one of the things that I think has always been true in all kinds of industries, but on the App Store for a variety of reasons, on smartphones and tablets, I think it's more true uh, than ever before. So, so we had these apps and then we put out this game and, and that's, that's the thing that became the hit. So I'll, I'll let this run for like a minute. seeing a million users download Tap Tap Revenge and then 5 million, 10 million, now 35, 40 million people have downloaded the game. Seeing that enormous community and that momentum and enthusiasm behind what we do has just been so much fun. There's a bird playing the game, that's really one of my favorites right there.
What was interesting for me about this, and you'll see it in some of the videos, that's, that's one of the highlights, but these numbers, they got so big, so fast, you know, like, I don't know if you noticed, but like a billion games played, and now these numbers get much bigger still, right? But remember, 2008, nobody had ever heard of 10 million downloads and 100 million downloads and a billion games played, and so, so that's one of the things that's really changed because of smartphones and, and, and tablets. So I'll skip past this just to keep us moving along. Um, and, and what happened with, with, with Tap Tap Revenge, the reason it became such a big success, first of all, was because the App Store launched and we had the combination of this phone and gaming and music. And this was just after Rock Band and Guitar Hero had become so successful. And so people got this new thing and they could download an app and that was an obvious thing to do. And also it actually existed before the App Store because I had started building apps in what's known as Jailbreak. Uh, about half of our users were in China, in mainland China, because if you had an iPhone and you wanted to use it not in the US and not on AT&T, then you had to jailbreak your phone. And then people would install kind of a, like a little app store. Uh, and so we had users playing the game before there was an app store. And so, so this thing became a hit largely because we were, we were very early. And so when we had told people our goal is to get a million users in 18 months, um, we actually got a million users in 20 days, 21 days. And so it was kind of amazing how, this, how fast this whole thing grew. And it stayed the biggest game until, until Angry Birds two years later. Um, another thing that really helped us is 552. And so 552, that's the number of apps on the App Store on day one. So that's crazy, right? I mean, I, I couldn't believe the number. I thought it was 3,000. Of course, today it's 1 million, but there were 552 apps on that very first day, and, and we launched on, on, on that day. So it's really good to be early sometimes, uh, and there's a lot less competition back then. And then the other thing that happened to us is, and, and, and you'll notice this a lot, I think, if you're an entrepreneur, is that... You know, you get lucky sometimes. And what happened to us is that um, after maybe one month, the game was starting to go down in popularity. It was like number 70 or something on the charts. And then Steve Jobs came on stage uh, to announce the new iPod Touch uh, in time for the holidays. I think what actually happened is that Steve liked the colors because it's got this beautiful thing. It's got the red and the yellow, and it's very symmetrical and it's very zen. And I think, I think that's what actually really happened, is that it was the holidays, and it kind of looks like a Christmas tree. So it has that sense of holiday, and they decided to use this as the promotion for the iPod Touch, the very first iPod Touch that came out. And so for six months, every time you open the newspaper, you see an ad for this stuff, boom, there it is. And so we got lucky. And, and we were about to start focusing on other apps, and then this thing came back, and it stayed in the top 20 for, for about two years. So, so luck, to be honest, had a lot to do with it. And we built out a nice business uh, in, in, in games, and then three and a half years ago, uh, Disney uh, acquired the company. They were looking, uh, I think what happened is that Steve Jobs was a, the largest shareholder, as you heard from, from Alvi today. He actually made his money on Pixar. <laughs> and he ended up on the board of the Walt Disney Company. And I think there was a lot of desire, and I think Steve Jobs is a very persuasive guy, as you heard from Alvi, uh, and he, I think he was pushing Disney to be more, to have more vision and have a more aggressive uh, focus on the App Store. And so they bought our company because they were looking for entrepreneurial energy and leadership and vision, and, and, and that's the next three years of my life. And it turned out that I'm not really a big company kind of guy. I'm an entrepreneur, a builder. Uh, uh, but Disney was a great place for me. And I think one of the reasons is that um, Disney's always bet on technology. This is 1928. Uh, this is, it's the first animated cartoon that has a full soundtrack, too. It's called Steamboat Willie. It's the first appearance of Mickey Mouse. And it's, it's pretty awesome. The original Mickey Mouse is so beautiful. And, and over the years, Disney Walt had did that and then other parts of Disney is investing in technology in a very aggressive way to offer these amazing uh, experiences at the parks and in the movies. And of course, you know, leading all the way up to, to what you heard about this morning, uh, the acquisition of Pixar. And so over the, this is actually one of my favorite clips and Alvi didn't play it, so let's, let's let this run.
mean, this speaks to the talent of Alvi and, and, and John Lasseter, and, but also Disney of, I mean, look at that. It's a lamp, but they managed to breathe life into it, and that's the magic, that's Disney uh, at, at its best. And so if you look at what Disney does is they create these amazing characters and worlds, and, and Hal was just talking about the acquisitions of, of Marvel. Uh, I, you didn't mention that one, but Marvel was another really huge acquisition a few years ago, and, and, and Lucas. Um, so we have these, this amazing collection of heroes and princesses and superhero princesses now um, that people dream about all around the world and then technology is a lot of how we bring these characters to life and then and then how we distribute them uh, and 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 every 10 years or so there has been a technology disruption that has changed uh, how much of our content uh, gets distributed and so starting with TV and then 10 years later it's cable TV and then it's the internet and social networks but but the smartphones that's sort of the biggest shock that I think has happened yet in the last 30 or 40 years um, because for the first time we can reach a billion and a half people with like one button and so, so think about this as a network. And so if you're a big media company, uh, then you do network deals for ESPN or whatever your business is. Uh, and you find distribution partners and you stitch together distribution and a network with these partners. But with the App Store and, and, and Google Play and the other smartphone platforms, you can reach more than one billion people. That's the largest network in the history of humanity. And and it's a network that's also the first screen, right? So there's a new generation of kids that are growing up in Hong Kong and in Europe and in Western and, 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 and in the United States and North America. And this is the thing that you look at when you wake up and this is the first screen. And then there are these big new markets, uh, in particular India and China uh, for, for, for Disney and other companies like it, where all of a sudden you have a billion people that are discovering your business and your brand and your IP for the first time. And in many, many cases, they're discovering these IPs, these intellectual properties and characters and worlds on tablets and Android devices and, and, and iPhones. So this is a super important platform for, for Disney. And what we had been doing, and there's still a fair amount of that going on at Disney and at all the media companies, is a, a strategy that's largely what we call synergy apps. So you have a movie that's coming out or a TV show or some other big event that's happening, and you make an app. Uh, and you, you, it's part of the marketing. Uh, and you'll see an awful lot of that is going on in the App Store every day by all sorts of companies. And, and the good news about that is that because you have these big events like a movie, there's a lot of marketing and social media and activity. And so you will go to number one or you will chart very highly uh, for a few weeks. Uh, but you may not stay there. And you're not going to have a lot of users over time and you're not going to make a lot of money over time because most of these people will download your app for free and play it once and then stop playing it and 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 the reason is that these apps they're sort of going about it the wrong way and so I'll tell you about in a second what I think a better ways to go about it but but that's the business that we found and that most media companies were doing which is lead with your big corporate events and 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 have a synergy approach to the whole thing and your apps fit into that and and we decided to try something different and we said this is an amazing new canvas and if Walt was starting today or if Alvi and 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 um, and the crew at Pixar were starting today Chances are, this, is, this may be where you start. This is the most exciting new platform. Let's figure out, can we bring these amazing Disney characters, can we bring them to life in exciting new ways on this platform, and can we also try to create new characters and new worlds that were born here in the way that Angry Birds was born uh, on the App Store. So, so the first thing we did uh, was this thing called AppMate. So let's run that for a few seconds. It's a little toy you buy and you put on top of your iPad. Lightning. Great to see you, man. Wahoo! It was this very cool thing where you could take a toy and you put it on the iPad and then the lights come on on the toy and you can drive around. Look in the mirror, the thing would follow you. It's kind of magical, right? You could play games. We had racing games and stuff in there.
So when, when this came out, a lot of people talked about it, and I think we did get a lot of positive uh, attention. It was the game of the year in a lot of places, etc. But it was kind of a bad idea. And the best way to explain it is that a billion and a half is better than 12. And what I mean by that is, for me, and there's many ways to build a successful business uh, on, on tablets and smartphones, but I think for companies like Disney, what's exciting about this is that network of the billion and a half people. And for me as an entrepreneur, if I was going to start a new company, that's also the thing that's exciting. But what we did with AppMates is, well, it only works on iPad. So instead of a billion people, now you have 100 million, or maybe back then it was 15 million, you know, very like some small fraction. And then you have to walk to the store, you know, and you have to buy something for $24 or something. And the store only exists in North America and Germany and the UK. And then you have to go download the app. Now there's 12 people left that use your app, you know? And so, and so to me, it was a beautiful thing and you can build a business that way, but I find it kind of a shame because you lose the power. The power of this platform is boom, no friction. A billion people, if they can talk about it, they can tell their friends, they click and they got it. And this was sort of the opposite of that. So then we decided to try a new thing. And that's Where's My Water? So we'll play that for a second. So I think many of you have already seen the game, right? So we'll skip past this, you get the idea. That's the trailer for the game. And, and that game came out maybe six months after the, the iPad um, app mate that I showed you. And that one has done really well. And it went to number one all around the world and it stayed at number one. That's sort of, going to number one is kind of easy if you have marketing and public relations. Staying at number one is very hard because Staying at number one means people love it and tell their friends about it and keep playing it. And so we stayed at number one for 60 days. I think that's the longest since, since Angry Birds. Um, and and I, I don't, this is an older number. This is the oldest number that we announced, but it's 250 million downloads is the, is, is the announced number. I'm, I'm from Belgium and there's 10 million people in the country, so it's so exciting. It's like, holy cow, that's like 25 times more than people are in my country. Uh, and there's like 100 million downloads in China that we have a hard time tracking because there was a lot of illegal downloads at first and not anymore, but it's amazing. We, we would undercount uh, sometimes by 100 million people. And then Disney built a whole the thing became kind of a Disney IP, you know, like a Disney character. And so you can, there's a YouTube video series that the people that make the videos make, and that's been watched tens of millions of times, and you can buy the t-shirt, and I have shampoo for my hair that's uh, after Swampy. So there's all this stuff, you know? And so it's an iPhone game that people at Disney loved, and then they started showing up in different parts of Disney. Different parts of the company started doing things with it, and that's, that's been one of the really great things about it. And I think the reason it worked, let me see if I can go back, is that we decided that the synergy way is not the way we wanted to do things. We decided it's, it's a, an American expression. We had the cart before the horse, right? And the cart should be behind the horse. And so instead of saying we have a movie coming out and the movie is about this character and this character, he can only do these things and the merchandise does that thing. And so all of these conditions, we decided that we should do things in the correct order. And the correct order for a game is the thing you do with your finger, you know? And so the team, we went to the team and we said, just make a perfect game. And it was like five people. And they played around and they found this thing where you use your finger and you cut through soil. And so these are the actual prototypes of, that's the first game. And so you see how they were playing around with what's called the physics engine. And what happens when you turn your phone and what happens when you put your finger on there. And they came up with, in game we call it a mechanic, a thing you do that feels very good and very intuitive. And when you cut through soil, then water goes down. And if it hits a rock, it stops going. Those laws, everybody understands. And we made that work in a very nice way on the iPhone. 
And once we had that working, I think in the other video that I just skipped by, you see that first we thought there would be seeds and when they get water, a flower comes out, but that didn't work. So once we had a really fun game, you know, and little bitsy puzzles, then we said, well, we're Disney. Why are you getting water down there? And the team thought about it and they said, because there's an alligator and he lives below the city. That's an American concept, you know, like there's these myth, urban mythology about alligators and he likes to take a shower. And, 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 and you would talk to people about it and you'd say, but alligators, they're not very warm, you know, they're not cute. And that's the point, you know, like great humor and great story is when unexpected things happen. And so we were very fortunate uh, because Disney just said, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> because they understand that, you know, and, and we gave our team the freedom and the company gave us the freedom to build a little world and a little story that followed the rules of storytelling that Disney is so good at um, and that made sense for the game and what you're doing. And so we ended up with this little game that were really fun puzzles that were really nicely done and a little character and little bitsy story moments that fit the iPhone and where it really felt like this thing was created for the iPhone in the way that Angry Birds and, and other titles were. So it was just really nicely done and kind of better than most anything else out there at the time when it came out. And that was really the key to the success of the game. I want to contrast that with one other game that I worked on that was also a big hit, and that's Temple Run Oz. So we let that run for 15 seconds. It's a really good trailer. Disney makes really great trailers. What happened is that there was a game called Temple Run that was really, really popular. And I had gotten to know the guy that built the game. And I said, you know, I'd like to work with you on something. And he said, let's do it. And the first game we built was Temple Run um, uh, Brave. Uh, and the second, we ended up doing one more around Oz. And we sat down with him and we said, look, we're Disney. We're the big company. We know how to do these deals. Uh, we want to make the game free. And it should be branded after, in that case, Brave, Merida, the princess, because she will be so famous because we're going to spend so much money promoting this movie. And we're, this is a Disney event, you know, that's very different than a little independent iPhone game. And so the game should be called Brave Temple Run. Now, the guys that were building the game, it was two people, uh, Keith and his wife, N uh, Natalia. And they said, well, no, we think it should be 99 cents because Temple Run is free and we don't want this new game to compete. We want this to be on a different chart, you know. And it should have the same kind of logo like our game. And it should be called Temple Run Brave. And so we sat down and we negotiated with them for like three months. And the result was that we had to do that. <laughs> and so it's one of the great things about the App Store is that sometimes the power is unexpected, you know. But as we think about why that game did so well, both of these games stayed in the top 25 for like six months which is kind of incredible, you know, like uh, Temple Run, the free game, left the top 25 after one month, and very few games stay in the top 20 anything for more than a week or two, and this was for six months. And, and the movie, people, everybody talks about a movie for like three weeks until it launches, and then for one more week, and then again when the DVD comes out. And so all the other brave marketing people sort of forgot about, but this game stayed there forever, and it was this amazing thing that people were like, how, did, how is that possible? People at Disney had a hard time understanding. But the reason is because that logo, everybody thought of as the Temple Run game, and it's so famous on the platform. And it turns out that on the platform, in many ways, the Temple Run brand was as big as the Brave brand or the Disney brand. And because it was paid, the pay charts, and this changes every few months, and Android different from iPhone and blah, blah, blah. But the pay charts, apps could stay in the top 20 much longer than, than, than on the free charts. And so ironically, all the stuff that we fought for with all of our smarts and market intelligence and we lost, those were the reasons why that game became such a big success. So sometimes you get, again, you know, you make the right decision by accident sometimes, and, and that, that was the case there. But it also speaks to the power of, 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 the, of that brand, you know, the Temple Run brand, one of the biggest games on the App Store. And so over the last three years, we built a nice network. Right? There were maybe one million people that played our games every month when I got there, but now every month, 90 million people play the games on our network. 
and on a good day, maybe 10 million people play the games, and we have seen something like half a billion app downloads. So we've had a very successful run, uh, and, and I've worked on 25 games that went to number one. And, and I'm very proud of that. But I want to talk about three more things that, that, that also happened uh, recently, uh, including on my watch. And, and the first one is, Where's My Water was this big success. And then we decided we need to do Where's My Water 2. Because when you have a franchise, you keep doing it. That's what you do, you know. Uh, and we have to be free to play. Because 99 cents, you know, it's not the best way to make money on the App Store. And so we put in what's called an energy system. You play four times and then you kind of run out of water. Oh my God, people hated that. And, and, and we got so many bad reviews and the good brand will that we had, we lost a lot of that and we had to reduce that. And when we reduced it, we stopped making so much money. And, 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 and it turned out that when you have something that's built one way, to change that is very, very difficult. And very few people have been able to take something that was built for a certain business model and type of usage and then convert it. And, and with Where's My Water 2, we kind of knew it was going to be hard, but that's been a really, I mean, the game's done, done okay, but not, but not as well as we wanted it to do. And then the next game that we put out was this game called Stack Rabbit. It's a really great game. It's kind of like Candy Crush, but a little different. It's a very innovative thing you do. Um, but the challenge with that game was that it takes four or five minutes to figure it out. And it turns out that people need to figure something out in 30 seconds. Uh, and, and we sort of broke the 30 second rule, and, and I'll talk about that in a second. And also, you'll notice that when something is in a category that has a dominant entrant, um, it's hard to compete with that. So we had a hard time being in the same category with Candy Crush. Um, and and I'll, I'll talk about this game a little bit later, just to, mo to move us along. And what I want to do now is, so those are some of the things that we did. I want to talk a little bit about lessons that we learned about the intersection between, um, that may be of interest to you guys, about the intersection between technology uh, and, oh, that's the wrong sign, and, and, uh, and, and technology and entertainment. So here's 10 things that I learned, and hopefully some of those will, will be of use to you. First of all, wow. This thing is big, you know. We thought it was going to be 100 million people. It was a billion and a half. And you see these big things happening, like the, the exit for, for WhatsApp. And I, one of these days, Uber, which is sort of taxis powered by apps, that's going to go public. I think that will be even bigger than, than WhatsApp. And, and as of 2011, as you guys know, people spend more times on their phone doing texting and playing games than they spend, you know, making phone calls. Uh, and so this thing has been a lot bigger and happened a lot faster than, than any of us thought. Um, but at the center of it uh, is fun. And, and when the PC came out, it, it was really an enterprise thing. And your company would buy computers and install IBM PCs. And then one day they give you a laptop to take home. And then the killer app is Microsoft Office so that you can work from home. Yeah. Um, well, here instead of it being from the enterprise down to the consumer, Steve Jobs first built this perfect device that's beautiful and very personal. And so it was the consumers that ran with it. And so it's from the consumer that it's been spread to the company and spread all around. And so the killer app is Angry Birds and other fun apps. And so when you look at this platform, first and foremost, it's about having fun and connecting with your friends. So when you look at the charts, this is a top 25, and it's the same on Android and the iPad. But if you look at the top 25 at any given point, you'll find five or six social apps, and then you'll find a whole bunch of games. And then there's three or four apps, like the Google app and Pandora. There's a Disney movies app there that are not games. But almost everything in the top 25 downloads will be games and, and, and entertainment and social apps. And it's the same on the grossing chart. It's, so it's where people are spending their time downloading and doing stuff and spending money. This, this app store and Android uh, are really dominated by games and social apps. So if you look at the time spent on apps between games and Facebook and entertainment apps, it's 60% or more. Uh, where this is, so this is what people are doing. This is a consumer device that's about fun and entertainment. And so, and so when you think about what's the closest thing to it, it's a world of a million apps and the best thing about these platforms, it's the platform itself. So when you go on YouTube, the fun thing is you browse videos and then you play one and every now and then you will send one to a friend or leave a comment. That's what an app is. 
you go to the app store, you discover new stuff, you play it every now and then, one of them you keep playing and you talk to your friends about it, but the platform itself is sort of the entertainment experience and that's, that's a really important thing um, that these apps tend to be consumable and, and we live in a world, and this is sort of the fourth big lesson, where the barriers to entry are just very different. And so you can be Disney sitting at number one with a really big brand like a Mickey Mouse app, and then one day some guy in Vietnam, this is the Flappy Bird icon. If, I don't know if Flappy Bird was as big here as, as it's been in, in America, but what you've got is you look at Disney and we've got our advantage is our brand. We have the Walt Disney brand, the biggest brands on the planet, and we have distribution. We have offices in each country and we have relationships with Google and Samsung and everybody else and we have scale, we have a lot of people and we can put a lot of muscle you know, behind the things that we do. But then this guy, the one guy in, in, in Vietnam that's not even doing it for a living, it's his hobby, he's fast and he doesn't have to get approval from anybody and he got distribution too because the most powerful distribution on the app store is the word of mouth and being featured by Apple and people talking about your app. And so it's kind of lopsided and you have big advantages as a big company, but as an entrepreneur, you have big advantages as well. So very low barriers to entry. And in that world, what we find is over and over again, the biggest driver of success is quality. And so you can look, this is an, the number one app in the US right now is an app called 2048. And it's a numbers game. Uh, and what's interesting is that the first app that came out that was almost the same game was called Threes, and it's on the left. And Threes is a very well done app. It's 99 cents. It's these guys worked at it for like a year. I love that thing. And they got these. There's like a little character down there. You know, they make a little smiley faces and they have little noises. Really beautifully done app. But then 2048 is free, and so you can get downloads faster, and it's easier. And it's interesting because you read interviews with the guys that built the Threes app and they say, well, three, 2048 is not as good as ours because look at, people can finish the game in five hours. That's a good thing. You know, people like things that are more approachable and they move faster. And because of how it works, it's kind of more addictive because of the simplicity of it. And so it's kind of a better game. And, and even though it's very hard to clone and copy something that's already a success, when your thing is better, and that's rare, but, but in the rare case, when you make something that's better than the original, you will win. Another example of that is, is Tinder, which is a, a dating app that's really, really, looks very simple, but it's an amazing thing. The app is so beautifully done, like when you, you look at the picture of the boy or the girl and you say, is she cute or not cute, right? Or he's, is he cute or not cute? And then you drag. But all the little animations and interactions, they're beautiful and it's perfectly done and it's very easy and very elegant. But the other thing, it's not just that it's a beautiful app, the concept, they were very thoughtful about how do we do that. We require you to come in with Facebook so that we know your picture is real. You can only talk to a boy or a girl if he likes you too, but you don't get any friend requests because then there is social pressure. They were very thoughtful about how they built that app and you know the concept, the, psycho the psychology of the user. And then there's the invisible stuff. Who do I show you based on what I know about people like you? is gonna drive the experience, it's gonna be very personalized. And so even though it looks very, very simple, it's a really well done app. And the apps that did not do as well, they're just not as good. I wanna give one more example of the power of quality. This is one of my favorite non-apps. This will take 30 seconds. What's up everybody? We're here at the iStrategy Lab workshop to unveil our latest creation, the PiPal, an internet connected button for ordering pizza. It's pretty simple. We 3D printed the enclosure, dressed it up with some LEDs, and connected the button to the internet with a simple web interface so that you can order pizza with the press of a button. So let's order some pizza. First, turn the dial to select the number of pizzas you want to order. Then press the center button to lock in your order. And when the LED lights up, your order has been confirmed. Here comes now the best just part. chill out because your pizza's been ordered and you didn't have to talk to a single person. I love this guy's home 30 office. minutes later. I have a pizza for Taylor. It's as simple as that. You just press a button and you get a pizza. And so it's a fun video, but, but it's the power of less. And it's actually, it looks so easy, but to make something simple is very hard because you have to say no to a lot of stuff. You also have to have good taste. And you, have to be very, and you have to be very clear about what your thing is about. And it turns out to be a very difficult thing to do that very few people nail. Um, and, and John Lasseter uh, of Pixar famously said, our business model is quality. And if you look at the examples of Angry Birds or what we did with Where's My Water and then what did not work for Water 2 or 
um, the app that we just looked at, 2048, or WhatsApp, or Tinder, all of these things are ultimately you know, testament to the power of, of quality and just having a better product. And it, it's the single, the single biggest lesson that I've learned. And I feel like I'm already running low on time or, you know, I'm going too slow. So I'll skip past the other ones or at least I'll try to go super fast. Word of mouth we've talked about, you know, WhatsApp, their marketing budget is zero, you know, and, and it's because their users are telling the story about how the app works. And it really changes how consumer technology can, can be disseminated. Um, the business models, instead of charging 99 cents for an app like you used to do, or being able to sell a DVD, everything is now really about how do I monetize what I would call engagement. So Candy Crush is free, but they're making $2 billion off that app. Because 1% of the users start really getting addicted and, and spend money. Another example, it's not the only company that's making this much money. Puzzles and Dragons is out of Japan, and they're making a billion dollars on one game. There's a company called Supercell. They have two, now three games. They also made $900 million on two free-to-play games. So, and it's because these, these business models, instead of monetizing up front, you monetize, you make money as people spend more and more time inside your app. And it's really a service. And so when you think of it that way, it's really not that different from what we had before. The cable company is a service. Netflix is a service. So the new business model is really about the business model that we all know about a monthly subscription or otherwise, finding people, getting them to use our product and then charging them as they use our service. We, you guys know, so I'll skip past this, that people are using these devices anytime and anywhere. And I've talked about the 30 second rule. So instead of organizing content sort of five minutes at a time, when we launched Tap Tap Revenge, every song was three minutes. But six months later, we realized people don't have three minutes. Because 30 seconds later, they will get distracted, the phone will ring, they will get email. So we had to create 30 second versions. And so 30 seconds is really, uh, I like to say it's the new 30 minutes. It's the organizing period of time. You can do a tweet, you can check a message, you can watch a YouTube video, you can play a game. That's the new unit of, of what an episode is, whether it be a YouTube post uh, or, or, or Facebook or a WeChat message. Um, and, and then finally, the great thing about this thing is this is this big wave, you know, that's, that's disrupting all sorts of industries. And it's just starting. We went from games to dating. And, we, you know, I talked about Uber. And now there's healthcare that's being transformed. And, and the stuff that we learned in gaming, because this is an entertainment device and because it's about building massive audiences, these principles that we learned with games, they kind of apply everywhere. So this is called gamification. But a simple example of that is Starbucks, you know, the card. When you go in, it goes, this is your fourth check-in. Here's a free coffee. And so all these principles, what you've seen in games, is really applying all, all across the board. And so we have a disruptive technology here um, that's changing all of our industries. And what's so exciting about it for me, um, I think we've already done these top 10, so I can maybe print them out or something. But I've learned other lessons. But what's so exciting about these for me is that we're at the beginning still of this thing that's really disruptive that rewards quality. Uh, and um, it's a blank canvas where you guys can write the future. So that's the talk. I think we have like five minutes for two questions or not even. What do you think, Al? All right. Well, that's it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. I told you it's hard to have the after lunch slot, so we had to have Mr. Energy here. Thank you, Bart. <laughs>